Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm Bill Gropp, the acting director of NCSA, and I'd like to welcome you to NCSA, where we are celebrating 30 years of changing the future. Our friends at Cray have provided us with a, uh, a video anniversary uh, uh, missive, um, which we'll play right now, and then we'll get on with the other introductions. We at Cray want to take this opportunity to congratulate the National Center for Supercomputing Applications on your 30th anniversary. This is a celebration of leadership in high performance computing that clearly shows the unique and influential role that the NCSA has played over the past three decades. Cray and NCSA have grown together over these decades and share a unique relationship that demonstrates collaboration and leadership in solving some of the world's most challenging computational problems. With the Cray system, Blue Waters, that currently resides in the NCSA's state-of-the-art data center, NCSA has been able to provide the U.S. academic community with sustained petascale computing capability that remains unmatched in the world today. Whether solving problems in astrophysics, such as predicting solar superstorms, modeling the structure of the universe, or modeling infectious diseases, the NCSA is a leader in United States computational capability. Cray is proud to be a partner with the National Science Foundation, the University of Illinois, the State of Illinois, and NCSA in this great endeavor. No doubt 30 years from today, we will look back and we will see that this was just the beginning of a long and fruitful journey together. From all of us at Cray, celebrate the day today, look forward to tomorrow, and continue to work to change our world for the better. Great. It's a very nice um, welcome uh, from Cray to us. I'd like to uh, recognize a few special guests uh, before we start the other introductions. So uh, Melanie Lutz is here from the office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. No, you can just. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, especially uh, Jim Carosa, who's the assistant director at NSF uh, for uh, its size, computing information. Science and engineering. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Ed Seidel, who is the University uh, Vice President for Research and also the Director of NCSA, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Bill. Thanks to Cray, and, and thanks to all of you for coming here. Um, I've just, I'm so excited about this day, and I'm, I'm so proud to be part of this organization, and still to be part of this organization. I'm, I've been seconded off to Henry uh, Admin Building, uh, and I can tell you um, on another time, uh, my, uh, my introduction to the university administration, which has been very positive, and I think there's a lot of synergy between what they're trying to do and what I think uh, this campus and, and NCSA in particular can do. But I wanna uh, really switch here and, uh, and welcome Larry Smarr, uh, but before I do that, I want to remind you all that we are having uh, an, another event, in fact, a sequence of events throughout the day. And in particular, I'd like to invite you to come to the reception between 4.30 and 6 out here um, in the atrium, and then between 7 and 8 at the Accord in downtown Champaign. We're part of the Pygmalion Festival, where we're going to just have a nice relaxed time and, and talk about some stories about, uh, about NCSA over the years, and, uh, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. So let me, let me come into the actual introduction of Larry. So you all have heard many times, I, I'm sure you have all heard about Larry Smarr, who uh, over 35 years ago, perhaps, I don't know exactly when, but um, began thinking about the need at a national level for uh, supercomputing facilities that were not available in the United States. In fact, there, there are legendary stories about Larry going to Germany, and I had the privilege a few years or a few months ago of going to Berlin to tell the story of this particular story of how Max Planck was a model for the United States, which is actually a quote in Larry's uh, proposal, uh, and then sort of how that plays back in Germany and around the world, the bold leadership that Larry took and how the NSF took, I would say, even bolder leadership afterwards in, in responding to Larry's proposal uh, in producing not one, but five supercomputing facilities 
out of Larry's unsolicited proposal for, I don't know what it was, 30, 40 million dollars, 55 million dollars. So imagine that. So to understand what an unsolicited proposal means, there's not a call for proposals. There's just suddenly arrives in the inbox of someone like Jim Carosa, here's a proposal for which you have no program for $55 million. And so I got such things when I was at NSF, and I'm like filing them in a drawer because I don't know what to do with them. But NSF actually took that and made the bold step to create those centers, and it has had worldwide impact, and there's just no question about that, but it really came out of, of, out of Larry. And I want to uh, say it's not only in academia, but it's also in industry. There's been a tremendous impact in the uh, American and even international industrial competitiveness following the leadership. Uh, when, when this uh, center was founded, a full-page ad was taken out in the Wall Street Journal to talk about revitalizing American competitiveness uh, as a part of this award to, to the University of Illinois, and that has actually happened. I just want to make one quick little anecdote, um, which I, I think I've never really told here uh, in public, uh, about uh, my, my experience as a graduate student. So one thing that's often overshadowed is Larry's scientific contribution in the area of, of general relativity and, and black holes. And as a, as a beginning graduate student, I can remember sitting around at lunch with some of my fellow physics graduate students, and somebody said, and I just never forget this actually, said, there's this guy at Illinois who's working on colliding black holes. And then there was a lot of snickering, like, what, like, is, that's never going to happen. And I, <laughs> and I can remember snickering myself, but actually thinking inside, hmm, that, actually, that sounds pretty interesting to me. And so it's actually the one-year anniversary this week of the actual discovery of gravitational waves from colliding black holes, a, a process that was actually ridiculed by many people over many, many decades, and actually, it's, it's actually happened. But Larry was at the forefront of that way in advance uh, of many others. And I just want to, to uh, ask Larry to come up. I'll stop talking about him and have you come on up. And I really appreciate that you're here, and it's going to be a great day. So thanks for coming. Well, thanks very much, Ed, and uh, just wonderful to be back. In fact, it's just a flood of, of memories. Uh, I spent 20 years here, um, and 15 of those were with a up-and-running NCSA. I recognized a lot of faces uh, in the audience that uh, were part of making that all happen, and that's really what we really should be celebrating is the people uh, here at Illinois who took an amazing risk, actually, the sort of thing that we don't see much of in the United States. If we just saw more of it, we'd be better for the country. But uh, this place was willing to be bold, to, to, do, to take a dream and actually put it into reality. And I, and I gotta say, I, just one thing that you may not know, so I'm 68 years old. I was born October 16th, 1948. And one way I can remember that is that's the date on a letter from the Dean of Engineering here to the Princeton Institute of Advanced Study saying, we like this idea that you've got of making a computer for Johnny von Neumann and we propose to get funding to build a, a clone of that here at Illinois, which of course became ILLIAC-1. So I can safely say that this campus has been at the forefront of supercomputing my entire life. And that's unprecedented in the country, and that's one reason this was the perfect place for NCSA to come into being. Now, I would love to give an hour talk on each of these topics today. <laughs> but I think that would try your patience. And so what I've decided is to really just focus on supercomputing and many of the other topics. I was here a year ago and talked on the Pacific Research Platform and the, and the integration of networks and everything. I'm really going to try to focus on supercomputing and the way it transforms science. Um, starting 10 years before NCSA, and going to 10 years from today. Uh, and about a third of it will be on NCSA, a third of it on what's going on now in supercomputing, and then a third on the future. Well, this is how it all started. 
this was my PhD thesis, the structure of general relativity with a numerical illustration, the collision of two black holes, uh, back in 1975. Bryce DeWitt, uh, one of the most brilliant physicists uh, at the time, uh, was at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, <laughs> he had gone to Livermore. He got his PhD from Julian Swinger, who's a Nobel Prize winner at Harvard. He had gone to Livermore and had understood you could use supercomputers to solve uh, hydrodynamics. And so he had worked with Charlie Misner and a number of others to come up with the notion of solving Einstein's equations for general relativity in the full dynamics and strong field region when everybody else was doing analytic solutions only. Um, and he told me as a beginning graduate student, come on, Larry, these are just partial different, nonlinear partial differential equations. Just put them on the computer and solve them. I said, OK. And, uh, and so out of that, of course, those days uh, we were using the supercomputer at University of Texas Austin, CDC 6600, uh, and um, we were able to uh, develop, and particularly with Ken Epley, my, my graduate student, uh, a computer code that really took the two black holes, let them collide, and out of them came the gravitational radiation. And we could compute and then visualize, which will be a theme throughout this, um, what it looked like. Well, 40 years later, this was the amazing discovery, finally, of the collision of two black holes spiraling in, of course, not axisymmetric, um, and the ability to use those waveforms uh, computed from the supercomputer to uh, read out of the noise the actual signals and show, in fact, be able to figure out the masses of both the holes and so forth. Well. I was running on a megaflop peak supercomputer. And actually, Seymour Cray had helped design the CDC 6600, and then the 7600 I used later at Livermore to get the gravity waves. And we're now on petaflop computers. That's a billion-fold increase. Now, as a beginning graduate student, if Bryce had said, now you know it's going to take a billion times increase in speed of the computer before we can finish your problem. I'm not sure I would have taken it on as a grad student. But fortunately, I was too stupid to realize. Well, as I then, re we went on with my colleagues, Mike Norman, Karl Heinz Winkler, and many others to, to take many other areas of astrophysics and show that supercomputers could solve them for what we see going on in the sky. And I realized that, well, why couldn't we do this with all fields of science? And I started collecting, particularly, I moved here in 79 uh, from Harvard, um, collecting stories from the faculty, 16 different departments worth, of what could be done if we just had a supercomputer. And at that time, this place had the VAX 11780 and a thing called the VIP, the VAX Image Processing Facility, which is about as good as any place uh, professors had in the country. The Cray one was 400 times faster. And the way I knew that is when I went to the Max Planck Institute to work with Karl Heinz Winkler and Mike Norman, they had the first Cray one in Europe. I ran the code that had taken eight hours uh, overnight. That's the rate of progress you could make, one eight hour run a night. Put it on this uh, Cray, went, started to go off to lunch, and before I get to the door, it said, finished. I said, that's not possible. It took eight hours. Well, eight hours is 480 minutes. 400 times faster means less than a minute and a half. So every 10 minutes, I could make the scientific progress that I was making every day. And that was the aha moment. And so I created a write-up of this, which was at that time the most extensive write-up of uh, supercomputing applications ever done. Um, and by the next year, um, thanks to uh, Rich Isaacson, who was a program officer at NSF for gravitation, but he had said, Larry, it's time to turn this into a proposal. <laughs> and I said, but Rich, there's no program at NSF for this. And he said, at NSF, we believe in proposal pressure from the community. <laughs> uh, and of course, while I was PI, many other people, Bob Wilhelmson, Bob Haver, many, many of the uh, you know, giants of computational 
science and engineering were at Illinois were co-PIs uh, on this. And I'll spare you the details of the in interregnum two years, which were quite eventful, but this is the actual construction in the advanced computing building of uh, the uh, preparations for the Cray XMP to show up in 1985 as NSF gave us the award. Um, again, that building had been here since 68 when uh, ILLIAC 4 was going into it, but those were the days of rage and, and they were afraid for security. It was a DARPA project and so it was moved out to California. But this building was built, well the, think of the machine room, it's like the you know, these, these gothic tales of the, of the bride that's jilted at the altar and then she never goes out of her wedding dress or something. Well, that was the second floor. Um, and it needed about $2 million worth of refurnishment to be able to be a proper machine room. And, and thank goodness this campus stepped up to it and invested that money on their own so that we could, in fact, uh, set up NCSA. Well, one of the first things NCSA did was to uh, develop faculty and graduate students and postdocs on the campus to work with us on virtually every field of computational science and engineering. And this is uh, the group that, that worked together with me. You see Mike Norman, who of course now is director of SDSC, and in about 1990 maybe, um, Ed Seidel shows up, 89, 1989, a uh, year or two after this picture, uh, and came uh, from uh, Washington University in St. Louis to join and started working on black hole collisions. Um, uh, and, and, and then John Hawley in the center there uh, became the chair of uh, physics and astronomy at the University of Virginia. But the work that, I mean, these founded basically whole fields of computational astrophysics, and that was happening in many other, other, other fields. The thing I love about the Cray is you could sit on it. <laughs> I've got pictures of my little rug rat, uh, Joseph and Benji, crawling around you know, on it, um, and you can't do that with blue waters. <laughs> now, one of the, the things that was, there were a lot of things that NCSA pioneered, but one of the most important was scientific visualization. And we were fortunate enough to be able to recruit people like Donna Cox to come here, who uh, really brought a whole new vision of what she called Renaissance teams. The idea that while a scientist may not know how to do something that beautiful <laughs> from a visualization point of view, by teaming with artists and with computer programmers and so forth, you could build these teams that could uh, follow the work of, say, Bob Wilhelmson, the pioneer in, in understanding the development of severe thorns by just solving the laws of physics in the atmosphere, from the original uh, work back in 87 to this ultra-resolution tornado genesis uh, visualization. And so the idea of visualization is not pretty pictures, it's insight. You know, if you've got a computer that is doing, in those days, a few billion 13-digit multiplies a second, which of those numbers do you want to look at to get that understanding? So the idea of scientific visualization was actually an intermediary technology to the human eye-brain system, the best pattern recognition computer yet today on the planet from these great supercomputers starting with the laws of physics. And that chain requires all of those. By the way, John von Neumann uh, uh, knew this and in fact in the early days he wrote that when computers were like a flop or something, you know, floating point operation a second, he said that they would generate so much data that it would overwhelm the human mind. And so we needed to turn it into a visualization by running the output of the computer into an oscilloscope. So this idea was there from the very beginning of digital computers. But NCSA took it to a whole nother level. And indeed we set up a whole 
computer graphics uh, facility with a number of really famous people, but one of them was Stefan Fangemeyer, who ran the uh, uh, computer graphics group here in, um, in 1987. And the idea of being able to use science as the basis for visualization and not just artist imagination of what it might look like, he took that to Industrial Light and Magic and it showed up in you know, Twister, Jurassic Park, Terminator, Perfect Storm, and so forth. It, and, and so again, this is, a, this is a, a not well understood legacy of the work here at NCSA. And, and, and this, of course, affects everybody in the whole world who goes to the movies. We were very fortunate to have up at the other campus in Chicago, um, the Electronic Visualization Lab that was founded by Tom DeFonte and Dan Sandin and Maxine Brown, who was there, uh, there wouldn't have been a PACI grant here, the Alliance, if it wasn't for Maxine Brown. There wouldn't have been a renewal of this, the first renewal grant without Maxine Brown. Maxine worked with me as a colleague to write those proposals, to take all the input from the scientists and make it into uh, award-winning prose uh, that, uh, award-winning in the best sense, <laughs> that you get money, <laughs> an NSF award. Uh, but uh, it, the idea of, of, of the, that you could not just look at 2D, but actually immerse yourself in full virtual reality, they developed the cave, we were the second cave on the planet here in 92, and then of course could hook that to the supercomputer and make it available in the national community. John Stevenson, who helped, uh, who fundamentally without John, we wouldn't have had the level of success we did in our industrial program. Um, uh, he was, a, of course, a, a leader in industry, and he brought the understanding of how you deal with this across this chasm between academic research and, and the corporate world and produced one of the most outstanding corporate programs in, in anywhere in the United States that's ever been. Um, and an example of just how closely uh, these technologies were able to be uh, driven actually by companies like Caterpillar, they drove by their investments and their interest in using virtual reality to create uh, working models in virtual reality of their new earth moving machines before they were built just out of the CAD CAM drawings. And then they were actually worked with us to show how you could have a global uh, set of Caterpillar uh, people working on the details like where do we put the fuel tank uh, uh, opening and, and operator visibility and, and things like that. And they drove much of the uh, virtual reality technology here for years. But it wasn't just helping the companies. The companies then learned they could help the public. And so Motorola, for instance, uh, became a sponsor with one of the great breakthrough movies uh, that was done uh, by Donna and, and Bob Patterson, um, uh, who brought this whole, Bob, of course, had, had been a uh, worked in, 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 in the industry and, and understood so much about what it takes to do these kind of large-scale projects. And so his teaming with Donna was uh, an extraordinary uh, happening. And they realized they could take things like Colliding Galaxies, which turned out to be part of this uh, IMAX film, uh, that was uh, actually Cosmic Voyage, was nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, this was, again, taking the results of supercomputing science and making it available to the whole world through, through IMAX, um, extraordinary thing. And if you, this couldn't be done today, post 9-11. The, 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 what Donna had to go through to smuggle the, the tapes through the airports to get them from where they were created in San Diego Supercomputer Center back here is, is legendary. Uh, I don't think TSA Donna would, would let you do that today. Um, but that's why we have 10 gigabit networks hooking up NCSA and SDSC now. Well, with Blue Waters, uh, NCSA really differentiated themselves. Um, I know Sid Karen, who, you know, we had this, uh, um, what do they call it? 
um, where you're both competitors and, and, um, and yeah, right, and collaborators. Um, but with Blue Waters and the Congress deciding that NSF should make a leadership machine, NCSA really became, you know, when I named it, Sid always hated it. He said, Larry, how did you have enough sense to call it the National Center for Supercomputing Applications? And, and I called mine the San Diego Supercomputer Center. <laughs> he never forgave me for that. Um, uh, and, uh, and so with this, you really became the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Um, and again, tremendous investment by the state of Illinois all along. If the state had not invested as it did in this place, we would not have achieved what we did. And the campus investment and the NSF investment, that three-way investment is what made this place so special uh, and allowed us a lot of the free energy of innovation. Uh, that we had. So, you know, I was preparing this talk and I said, well, you know, these are the supercomputers I helped bring together uh, in the 15 years I ran in NCSA. And you can see that this is on a log scale of the how many times faster powers of 10 than a, than a single processor XMP was. Um, I wonder where Blue Waters fits on this. Now, you may guess the fact that I'm shrinking down this size to make room, uh, but I didn't know how it would work out. You'll see that in 1995, there was a fundamental shift where I realized, thanks to Forrest Basket uh, explaining to me, that the, that the clock cycle on uh, the uh, global demand for microprocessors was, was going at a much steeper exponential rate than the few hundred people that bought craze. And, and so I decided to take uh, the step of, of, of going to the microprocessors a little early. And this was quite controversial. But I think this, the change in the slope of the log plots indicate that that was a, uh, an idea that made a lot of sense. And if you look now, these were the original, that was the XMP, there was the Cray 2, and so forth. Here's the origin, the forest of origins. So I then took wind blue waters came, and there's it is at about 50 million times a XMP processor. And you can see that that switch to that higher growth rate that NCSA was probably the first in the country to do, that that has continued passed uh, all the way up to, to Blue Waters. And, and so that was a historic shift because that, if, imagine that we had stayed on the lower, on the slope down here, right? We'd be about uh, 1,000, so 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 times slower today. And so it's this ability to take risk based on your knowledge of where the technology is going that has made all the difference. Now, another thing that I find isn't well understood is that there is a flow from NSF investment at the leading edge to the whole global mass market of consumers. Here's a good example. So when we had this, this is a gigaflop, this is the beautiful uh, NCSA rendition of, I don't know where they got the mood lighting, but um, <laughs> of the YMP. It was about a $15 million computer, which doesn't sound like much in these day and age of, you know, $200 million supercomputers, but back in the day, that's what it cost to have a supercomputer. Um, and the backbone, which started the NSF net backbone by connecting the five supercomputer centers at about 56 kilobits for the shared pipe across the country, had grown to a whole megabit per second. <laughs> Here we are today where there's a billion smartphones. They're about um, almost a million times cheaper, 100,000 times cheaper. And you get megabit through the air to each of them, not shared by the whole country. Now here's a, I, I, I love going out and looking at um, and grabbing headlines. 
the top 10 best smartphones, two gigahertz, which was faster than the CPU and the YMP, to buy in India. Right? This is the world we're in today. And everybody walks around in your pocket, and this thing is faster than a Cray 2. Now, remember on the Cray 2, our astrophysics group was doing general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic accretion onto rotating black holes on a computer that was slower and less memory than this. Now, what are you doing with yours? <laughs> Facebook updates and angry birds. <laughs> oh well. But you might say, well then why is NSF's out of business, right? I mean, it's all over. No. Blue Waters is a million times faster than the YMP. So NSF just keeps moving the goal lines exponentially ahead of the consumer market. And that is why that is one of the most important things that keeps the United States in its competitive position worldwide. The NSF is unique in, in my view, in the world, in continually working at the outer edge, driven by the best ideas that come out of the user community, uh, and then that is very well coupled back into the corporate world, into the consumer market. Now notice the, that, that there's a little bit of software development that had to happen here, because in the old days we thought it was hard to program four processors. Now you've got 400,000 processors on Blue Waters, give or take a few. Um, and so software has been a huge part of this story uh, and doesn't get nearly enough credit. But you'll notice that all of those examples were solving partial differential equations, the laws of physics that we've spent 500 years figuring out. But we're in a moment of transition in which data science and data analysis is becoming as important, if not more important, than traditional supercomputers. And a previous uh, NCSA director, Dan Reed, uh, co-authored this paper last year and the, was the cover of communications at ACM, scientific discovery and, innova and engineering innovation requires unifying traditionally separated high performance computing and big data analytics. And once again, NCSA is at the forefront of this. Now going back at least to the late 2000s, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the LSST, this supercomputer center is essentially converting the photons coming from the entire universe onto this telescope that looks at the whole sky every night and sees what changed, what has moved, changed magnitude, changed color. And that is sitting down in Chile. It's being built as we speak. It, it should be online in about four years. There's so much data coming from that telescope that there needs to be two 40 gigabit per second, 40,000 megabit per second optical fibers dedicated to bring that data from Chile on the mountaintop to this supercomputer center, NCSA, and they're tracking 40 billion objects in the universe and they're finding one to 10 million changes a night and sending alerts out to everybody in the world to go look at those spots. That's an extraordinary example of data science. Now, as an astrophysicist, I say 40 billion, well, that's nothing. Why, I did X-ray and radio and optical observing of Andromeda, and there are 100 billion stars in Andromeda, right? And then there are 100 billion of those galaxies. That's an astronomical Number, that's how come astrophysics is king of the hill, right? Well, let's come to our little miserable speck of a planet and look at the microbes. There are 100 million times as many bacteria on Earth as all the stars in the universe. That 100 billion times 100 billion, multiply that times 100 million more. And just on one planet, 
This is why I've converted from being an astrophysicist to working on the microbiome. Because, as Julian Davis says, once the diversity of the microbial world is cataloged, it'll make astronomy look like a pitiful science. <laughs> Now, once again, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has been a pioneering leader in this field. And so I'm going to switch now to what I'm doing currently with the microbiome. Carl Woese developed a technique here at Illinois to um, essentially read what's called the barcode of life, one gene of the microbes and all living things that can tell what species they are. And then you can map out the difference, the distance in the DNA between different living organisms on Earth. And you can see there's, and this is what uh, Carl was very famous for developing, that there were three great pieces of the tree of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And so here you are at the tip of development of life on Earth in animals. And you're not that different from a slime mole or, or a mushroom compared to the DNA difference that exists across the world, and that's because almost all life on Earth has been evolved during single cell evolution, and that's why all the diversity is there. Well, Carl used to bring me, when I was running NCSA, used to bring me over to his lab and lecture me, and talk to me about the microbes as an astrophysicist, right? And I said, Carl, why are you doing this. You're a great man. You know, why are you wasting time on me? And he said, because one day you will be in a position to have influence and you need to know it's all about the microbes. <laughs> well, as many of you have been reading, uh, there is a revolution going on in understanding how we relate to microbes. And in fact, in terms of the human cells that you have in your body, they're about 10% of the actual cells with DNA in your body. And in particular, in your large intestine, in your gut, there are about uh, 10 times as many DNA cells as you have in your entire body. But more importantly, they, their DNA has genes, that each gene makes a protein, just like the human DNA. The only difference is there are 100 times as many different genes on the microbes DNA as there is in your human DNA. And yet, none of this is considered in today's medicine, right? So the inclusion of this dark matter, understanding what it is, because until the exponential reduction in the price of sequencing, we couldn't tell. That's why it's not part of medicine, but it will be completely transformative to medicine over the next five to 10 years. The work I'm doing now in the microbiome requires genome sequencing, that work would have cost one million times as much money to carry out just 12 or 15 years ago as it does now. It's much faster even than Moore's Law in reduction. So I decided, well, if the way it's going to work is that we're going to be able to just read out the information content of our body. After all, we are, we are like information entities, living creatures or information entities worked out in organic chemistry instead of silicon. And that information is in your DNA, but it's in your human DNA and the microbes DNA. And then you wanna read out the state of that person, which is in the biomarkers in your blood, your stool and so forth. So I decided, well, if that's gonna be the future and my job is to live in the future, then I should just start doing that. And so I started taking blood measurements and stool measurements, which is your stool, by the way, doesn't get much information respect. <laughs> you know, we gotta work on our attitude a little, cause one gram of stool, first of all, it's 40% microbes by dry weight, and one gram of stool has one billion microbes, each of which has a DNA three to five million bases long. Okay, so it's, it's the most information-rich material you've ever laid eyes on. <laughs> and what kind of respect do you give it, right? You just flush it. I mean, it's... Don't get me started. Anyway. <laughs> so what I realized is that as an astrophysicist coming in from the outside and teaching myself all this biomedical stuff by just reading all the scientific literature, um, we're nonlinear dynamic multi-component coupled systems. 
So as an astrophysicist, the only logical thing to do when you see something funny going on in the sky is to get time series measurements. How does it flicker and change over time, right? Somehow this isn't the way we think about humans, even though that's the reason our cars work today the way they do, is that we would just simply record the spark plugs and the brakes and everything else, go in for preventive maintenance, compare that against the population of all other cars of your make and model, and then if you're in the middle of the bell curve, you don't need a human, and that's how come we can afford it. We don't do that with medicine yet. So I gather data. This was, I just did this uh, last week, uh, about 20 vials for my last one. Um, and then we just plot it out. And amazingly enough, I thought I was healthy. I found out that one of these variables, which is called lactoferrin in your stool, and it should be lower than that green line. It should be less than seven. And I was up to 125 times the upper limit for healthy. But you see, if, if you were going to the doctor, and first of all, he would never do, ask you to get this test, but if you did, and you happened to go in on this day, he'd say, well, you're normal. And if you came in on this day, he'd say, we need to put you in the emergency room, right? So this idea that we're, if you don't do time series, given the fluctuations that occur in, in the disease state, how would you know what's going on? But, you know, anyway. If you then read in the literature, okay, well, how can you get a lactoferrin this high? It says that you have to have an autoimmune disease, a, actually a chronic incurable disease that is set in your human DNA from birth uh, of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, in particular Crohn's. Well, I said, okay, I guess I missed that memo. Um, I was kind of shocked to find that out. But I said, what does that mean? Well, it, it's the immune system. Well, what's the immune system getting all worked up about? It's the best in the artificial intelligence system in the universe. How come it's out of whack? Well, because it is tightly coupled to your microbiome. Well, that must mean your microbiome is out of whack. And so I said, well, how, what does it take to figure that out? Well, you have to genome sequence this stuff. And so I started working on a project that uh, worked with the Craig Venner Institute to sequence things. Now Rob Knight has joined us, and we're having a vastly bigger uh, joint project. But effectively what it is, is, is the NIH had funded about a, a quarter of a billion dollar program to sequence healthy people in, and see what their microbiome. We could take down the raw reads from that. So what happens is you put this, you, you take, uh, you know, think you've got like hundreds of microbes, they each have DNA, you break it all up in what's called shotgun sequencing, you put it through a genome sequencer, Illumina sequencer, and then out comes a bunch of little um, puzzle pieces. Each is 100 A, T, C's, and G's DNA bases in a row. We know this is somewhere in that mess. We know this happened, right? Now you get one or 200 million of those per sample, and you do it across 300 people. Uh, about 300, 250 have are healthy, and about 50 say with, with IBD. And then you use, in this case, 25 CPU years of computing, which fortunately I was able to get a director's discretionary grant from Mike Norman and from Brian Kusick, who's in the audience somewhere here. He generously uh, gave me time on the R systems. Uh, and the other thing I need to say thanks for Brian, not only the fact that he helped run the machine room at NCSA for many years, uh, he's the only person who ever named a supercomputer after me. Uh, his R smar um, as supercomputer. Anyway, um, so this is big data science. So this, when you sequence all these healthy people, the people that had IBD, me over time series, you ended up with almost three trillion DNA bases, which we then put through a software system that I'll spare you going through. And what you end up with is reconstructing the DNA of the distribution of species that must have been here. Now, you can't read those, but every bar is a species of microbe. And that's why we have a 64 million pixel wall that's 50 times this resolution at Cal IT2, so you can read them. <laughs> and that's on a log scale. So what, you, what it means is you have, this, you have a more complex diversity inside of you than a rainforest or a coral reef. Each of these colors are for phyla. 
Phyla are the subdivisions of life. So for instance, if you think about, we think about biodiversity. Okay, well, we got our giraffes and we got our blue whales and we got our goldfish and we got our humans and we got rattle, you know, rattlesnakes, that's biodiversity. They're all vertebra. And vertebra is a subphylum of one phylum, chordata. Okay, so this is like all of the animals, all the insects, all of the corals, all of the mollusks, right? Inside each of you. But, depending on your state of health or disease, you have a very different one. So it might, so the disease is, think of the disease as like an oak forest is like healthy and then the forest fire comes through and that's disease, right? And so we can now measure this in detail, quantitative detail. So for instance, Clostridium difficile kills over, almost 20,000 Americans a year. It's in all of us. But when you go in a hospital and they whack you with antibiotics and knock out all these good guys that are orders of magnitude, more abundant, their ecological services are no longer there to suppress the weeds. Okay? That's the kind of thing you can learn. Okay, well I knew we were gonna be needing to look at a lot of different microbes from a lot of different people, and so I asked Philip Weber to come up with a visualization on the wall um, that could take, for instance, 20,000 people, each with 60,000 different, of course, initially I was looking at species, now we're gonna go to genes. We're actually gonna go to a million genes across the, the microbes per person. And then draw the lines of different uh, weight depending on what was the most abundant to the least abundant. And this is what it looks like, and it's, and it's that, I mean, it, it just moves just like you're on your PC, right? Even though it's of that scale. And so we recently used it to map out this set. We, we didn't, I know you can't actually see the details, but what you'll notice is the iliochromes are way off from where the healthy people are. And what I'm doing here is from each dot is a person, I'm then going to all of the dots that are the microbe species. And what you can see here is by using visualization in data science, you can actually note that the disease states are like islands of different ecologies compared to what it was when you're healthy. And I give lots of full hour lectures on this, so I won't go into this more, but, but this is an example of how we're using supercomputers to, uh, to do data science on something that is so fundamental that President Obama has now made this a national initiative in the microbiome uh, just uh, May this year. Well, you might ask, Okay, Larry, so you start off doing solving Einstein's equations for general relativity for the dynamics of black holes colliding and generating gravity waves. That sounds pretty complicated compared to, you know, figuring out what's going in, on inside your colon. Um, let's just do the numbers. Well, I, was, I did this early work, and of course the micro work is early work on this new field. On a CDC 6600, it took several hundred hours of computing. With Rob Knight, we now have 800,000 core hours on Comet. An individual Comet processor is about uh, 40,000 times faster than a CDC 6600. And instead of a, a few hundred hours, we ran almost a million hours. So that's about a half a billion times as much computing power to do the beginning work on what's inside of each of you as it did to do the colliding black holes and the gravitational radiation. Now, how many people are we going to do this on? Well, this is a quote from Eric Topol from um, two years ago. These days, it's sequencing 100,000 people or you don't even show up. So multiply that times 100,000 and you'll see why this is going to dwarf a lot of our physics and astronomy as we really get to precision medicine. And that means we're gonna need a lot more computer time. Well, fortunately, President Obama, who, since Congress won't pass anything, has plenty of time to work on executive orders, <laughs> um, has come out last year with the uh, National Strategic Computing uh, Initiative, and it talks about, by 2025, <laughs> delivering an exascale machine. Now, an exascale machine is a thousand times faster than a petascale machine. So um, that's 
the plan. But notice, and this is a radical statement that's buried in here, it will be increase the coherence between modeling and simulation, read that as classic high performance computing, and data analytic computing, which today is almost all done in the cloud using Hadoop and things like that, not on supercomputers. So if we are going within nine, almost eight years, <laughs> that's all we got left, to build the exascale and we're gonna, enter, we're gonna put all this stuff on HPCs, we had better come up with something a little more radical. Now, at this point, I am going into the future and this is on me. You can call this somewhat speculative. My feeling is by just momentum, we'll be able to get to the exascale with old fashioned technology. And by that, what I mean is here is a beautiful diagram from the Blue Water System Overview. And you will note that a node has down here as a shared memory multi-core, like is in your PCs or, or, or your cell phone, and then an NVIDIA GPU, which is in the parlance of, of the old days, a SIMD machine, a single instruction, multiple data machine. Well, that's what the CM2 was. So I didn't show you in that diagram the thinking machine CM2 and the CM5 that, that NCSA had, but that's the same architecture, the CM2 we had in 1988 as the GPU is today. And, and the Cray 2, which had a shared memory multiprocessor, is the same architecture fundamentally we have here. Now, enormous progress has been made in shrinking all of this down and, and incredible networks and developing a software and everything else. But fundamentally, from a supercomputer architecture point of view, not much change. So, what is Horace Simon, who's deputy director of um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab and one of the most advanced thinkers in, in the field of supercomputing say, we're going forward to a hybrid model integrating emerging non-von Neumann architectures. Now, von Neumann architectures are the basic fundamental architecture with clock cycles and input and output and so forth we've had for the entire history of computing. But there are a whole class of architectures that don't fit that model, which are called non-von Neumann, and that these have huge potential in pattern recognition, streaming data analysis, and unpredictable new applications. Well, no sooner had he said that than the cover of science uh, in 2014 is IBM coming forth with a brain-inspired non-von Neumann architecture that puts a million neurons and 256 million synapses in silicon on the most advanced, most component chip IBM has ever fabbed. And um, then, just literally two years later, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, also the supercomputer center that we cloned, by the way, explicitly to make NCSA, bought a four by four array of these uh, neuromorphic chips uh, and is uh, collaborating, this is uh, uh, from a, a release by Lawrence Livermore, they're collaborating to build a brain-inspired supercomputer that will be used in deep learning, pattern recognition. And Demendra Moda, who I'm proud to say got his PhD from the University of California, San Diego, Jacobs School of Engineering, says on the drawing boards, and this is 16, are 64, 256, 120, 20, 4096 chips. It's limited by money, not uh, imagination. So this idea of scaling up brain-inspired silicon uh, chips in a way that is completely different than GPUs and and, and Intel multicores, which are von Neumann. Well, fortunately, um, this is a professor at UC San Diego who was one of Demendra Moda's professors when he was, Demendra was getting his PhD, and Demendra is fond of saying this is the only professor at UCSD who ever gave him a B. <laughs> Tough guy. And he's one of the most distinguished and learned people in all the different modes of machine learning uh, that we have, and so here is an, in that box, brown box, is the uh, IBM True North coming to uh, Cal IT2 as the building you see in the background there. 
Uh, Dan Golden, who was the longest serving NASA administrator, I convinced to come uh, to San Diego uh, over 10 years ago to do a startup. He's now in his 70s, but they just announced uh, June 6th, New Edge, and the Wall Street Journal, that's a Wall Street Journal headline. This is not crazy stuff. This is the Wall Street Journal reporting on corporate news. Brain-like chips. And in, from a press release uh, over there, New Edge and Cal IT2 have worked since the beginning. We actually took the challenge that Dan had after spending two years in the Neuroscience Institute to design a processor that would, would put into silicon what uh, we had learned about how the brain works. And you'll notice, for those of the tech folks in the audience, this is a multi-layer cluster of digital signal processors that don't have a clock. This is asynchronous. So this is a completely different fabric from what we're used to working in. And so we're bringing, that is now in our pattern recognition lab as well. So we've created this pattern recognition lab in Cal IT2 to bring this whole new generation of non-von Neumann processors in, put them in the presence of GPUs and, and Intel multi-cores to handle the general purpose stuff, and then bring all the different machine learning algorithms onto those and optimize them for a very wide set of applications. Now, as I look forward for the next 10 years, I see four things really driving this move toward brain-inspired computers. First of all, going back to what Donna originally told me, you know, we did, we've got, it's, it's not really true, but you sort of have these two kinds of your, your brain, the, the pattern recognition part and then the logic math part. And um, today, our supercomputers basically just have one part. <laughs> So there's, the, there's this other part that's got to be developed. Now here's the thing that's kind of spooky. This is from Horst Simon, who's a really hardcore guy, right? Um, this is not crazy stuff. Um, this is the red line in the middle is the top, one, top 500 uh, fastest, uh, number one fastest computer in the world. And you can see that, that where the red arrow is, it, this is here, they actually ran a simulation of about four and a half percent of the neurons in a human brain. Um, by uh, 2020, at an exascale, you'll be able to run in real time a simulation of 100 percent of the scale of the human brain. Now sometimes people say that when we get to an exascale, it will be effectively as fast as a human brain. Hard to say, because we don't know for sure what that means. The brain does things totally differently. One of the things it does totally differently is um, you guys, well, I'd say you're, yeah, you're not much more than running on about 20 watts at the moment. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, the, but the exascale will be 20 to 30 megawatts if we can get the energy consumption down that low. That means that biological evolution has figured out how to get a computer to run a million times more energy efficient. Now we cannot throw that away. So what I've been saying for 15 years is we're going to have a new form of computer science and engineering emerge which abstracts out of biologically evolved entities, living creatures, what the principles of organization of those computers, if you like, are, which is totally different than engineered computers. And another of President Obama's initiative, the brain initiative, is reverse engineering the brain at just the time we need it. <laughs> and in particular, you can see here at Cal IT2, this is a, a very high resolution um, uh, confocal light microscopes of a, of a rat brain cross section, a cross section of the cerebellum. And in fact, if you look at it, if you zoom in, it looks like this. And there you can see the individual uh, Purkinje uh, neurons with their blue DNA nucleus, and then like a tree coming down from each of those is the dendritic overlap region, and that's exactly the model of IBM put into the true north, right? Um, so we're gonna have much more on that. So what this means is that artificial intelligence on these traditional plus brain-inspired computers are all of a sudden hooked together with enormous amounts of data compared to what artificial intelligence has ever had by many, many orders of magnitude. And so AI is in a takeoff. 
I'll give you an example. This is from Wired Magazine. So this is from May of 2014. The mystery of Go, the ancient game that computers still can't win. Then, unbeknownst to Wired, a few months earlier, Google had acquired DeepMind, which was the company that had the most advanced thinkers and, and, and deep belief neural networks. Um, and so then they set out to figure out how to beat Go. They took 30 million moves of the best Go, ma Go masters on the planet, fed those into this, and then that would have been made a computer you know, who could sort of hold their own. Then they ran it against itself as an artificial intelligence for millions of times, coming up with moves ago that no human had ever conceived of. And so in less than two years, games, uh, Google wins the fifth and final game against Lee Sado and um, the number um, four or five best Go master on the planet. That was less than two years. Now then, Google takes that software, that incredible software, what a treasure trove, and makes it open source and gives it to the world community in TensorFlow. And we're using this every day at, at Cal 82 to program these new uh, chips. And as Jerry, uh, Jeremy Howard, who, by the way, if you ever want to look, you should re watch his uh, video because he's taking this to understand how to read x-rays and to make every doctor as good as the world's best doctor at reading x-rays um, using this artificial intelligence. But he says, basically, instead of programming the computer to do something, you give it a few examples and let it figure out how to do that. That's the new paradigm. Uh, and, and, and so I'm almost done here, but I just want to point out that while this sounds a little science fiction-y, it's all happening. Microsoft is taking FPGAs, which are field programmable gate arrays, which are a non von Neumann architecture, and they're putting them as coprocessors at every one of their servers for Bing. Not only that, your sister supercomputer center TAC at Texas has been given by Microsoft 432 of these non von Neumann processors to make them available to the academic community for innovation. And Google, which they didn't tell anybody until after they beat the guy over in Korea, said, well, gee, let's just build a non von Neumann specialized chip, an ASIC, that will make TensorFlow go really fast. <laughs> and then they put it into every one of the things they were running against the thing to just soup it up, you know, sort of an unfair advantage. But it's the way the world's going. And so where is this, what does this mean to ordinary people? Well, you know, Watson is an example of one of these things where IBM's betting the farm over a billion dollars on Watson, and that's where medical coaching is. But where are we going? How many of you saw the movie Her? All of you should see it. All of you should see it. If you want to know one of the best examples of speculative fiction about where this process is taking us, where you have individualized, personalized learning about you, the more you interact with them, the better they know you, personal assistance, except they're working with everybody across the planet. So I was asked by the New York Times to write a, a short piece on, on the future uh, a few years ago, back in 2011. And, and, and the way I look at it is with, you're gonna be able to take this planetary computer, they're gonna be able to build computational models of the subsystems in your body, just like we have for so many things in astrophysics. All of you, how many of you are wearing a device that's streaming to the cloud, your current body right now? How many? Oh, come on, get with the program, folks, let's go. Okay, how are we gonna do this future if you don't be part of it, okay? And so, and so what it is is you have this population-wide set of streams coming up, that's why you need these, these pattern recognition computers to do the real-time in, uh, interpretation of the data. And then that can tell when you are beginning to get out of line on something, or you might be about to drink a Coke or, or something that you might want to pause and think about what that's going to do to your body. And you might want to make a better choice. And the little good angel is going to sit here and say, 
Uh, I've been reading your glucose recently. Um, and I mean, you can go ahead and drink it if you want, but I'm gonna be sad. <laughs> and, and so that this will coach us to um, a much healthier lifestyle. Now, that's what I think is so fantastic about the future, in future meaning five to 10 years. But there's a potential downside to superintelligence. And this is fortunately getting a global discussion underway. And I've worked with all four of these people. Um, and I love Stephen in particular. Success in creating a, a super intelligent AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last, unless we learn how to avoid the risk. Now, this is nothing new. Remember when I grew up, I read Asimov's robot series, and he had the three laws of robots to protect the robots from doing harm to humans, right? We'll get through this, I believe, but only if everybody realizes this is a changing, you know, one of the most important change moments in human history. And it isn't gonna be 100 years from now. It's gonna be in the next five, 10, 20 years. And so one of the things I'm hoping is that NSF will be getting a lot of this research into the universities, into young people, where they can start imagining these futures, playing with these new technologies, and helping us avoid some of the risk that these four of the smartest people on the planet uh, are talking about here. My guess is that NCSA and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign are gonna be one of the leaders in that. And that it's gonna be very important to the future of the planet. Thanks. inspiring uh, and exciting and I expect nothing less from Larry so uh, thank you Larry uh, I think we are running a little late but maybe we could take a, a question or two and then I just want to remind you again we're having a, a, a important event in the atrium at 430 and then also at the Accord downtown in Champaign at 7 this evening so do we have a, a question or two thank you thanks to Larry for showing that's uh, so how the edge is getting sharper. We Skip it. Yeah. 
the interest in this is that it may be I'm number Occasionally, well, to the first number is sixteen. By the time we get to five or six, you're talking about. Data. Very big. That would, if you will, uh, fill up the inside of the earth with the paper and the writing. She it all right. And then you go one more step. And and you're talking about filling up the universe with the exponent. Not the firmer number, but the logarithm of the firmer number. Mm -hmm. So, If a man or a 300 year old man of interest and it's impossible because the numbers are so Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, in calculating those numbers with all the digits, that's, of course, a real challenge for computer architecture because we approximate after 13 digits or something, regardless of the exponent. But it would be quite a challenge. To compute that. Are there other questions? Yeah. Hello. Well, hi. <laughs> See, seeing you and hearing you makes me feel younger than I know I am. <laughs> I, I wonder if um, you've thought, you were alluded briefly to the idea that antibiotics screw up your microbiome, which really points to the necessity for developing genetically specific antibiotics to replace the broad spectrum ones. I wonder if you've been thinking about that at all and what the computational challenges might be in developing genetically specific antibiotic therapy. Well, you know, one of the fundamental problems in the United States is that before the 60s, 1960s, antibiotics were given by injection because most of the single microbes floating around your bloodstream that were the enemies that the antibiotics were trying to get to were in your blood, so injecting them in the blood made sense. But that was not a mass market. And so oral antibiotics were developed so that it would be more people could take antibiotics. You just swallow them. The only problem is you swallow them and then they end up down the tube where your microbiome is. And so for this convenience that everybody can take antibiotics, we've paid for now 50, 60 years by uh, massive disruptions of our microbiomes. And the microbiomes, for instance, create probably 20% of all the metabolites, the small molecules that aren't proteins, that bathe through your bloodstream every organ in your body. And so when you disrupt the microbiome, you're disrupting not just your gut, you're disrupting your entire body. And there's a great book called Missing Microbes that uh, came out last year that really talks about this. 
Uh, in the United States, 80% of all our antibiotics are fed to fatten up farm animals. Now at a time that antibiotic resistant bacteria are becoming a global threat, and I don't know about you, but if you've seen mass factory farms, that is the perfect Darwinian breeding ground for antibiotic resistant bacteria. Do we really want to do that? If you, can t if you look at the per capita use of medicated von human antibiotics compared to say Scandinavia, the United States is way more uh, use of these things. So there's a lot of mega problems with our society that we've got to clean up before we get down to the nuances of you know, genetically sequencing, uh, genetically producing specific antibiotics. However, the good news is that there are a whole range of technologies besides antibiotics that are able to essentially garden your microbiome back to health. And we're gonna see a multi-billion dollar industry of foods, of uh, designer probiotics and things like this, even uh, phages, phage therapy, which has been around for decades, where viruses attack very specific uh, microbes to eliminate them. Um, and, and so this, this whole world is just gonna change. It's, it's, you know, when you have a disruption of this magnitude of finding out what most of us is about, Everybody starts thinking it's gonna be incremental change. We'll keep doing medicine the same way, it's just be a little different. Well, that's like what Tower Records thought when file sharing came out, right? You know, this, we'll just wait, we'll just wait this out, send some lawyers out, you know, sue the grandmothers and teenagers. Yeah, no, anybody been to Tower Records lately? <laughs> How'd that work out? So this is going to be a mega disruption of uh, the existing medical industry, and, and I think a period of enormous innovation and discovery uh, in, in uh, how to live a more healthy life. Like I say, I would love to give you a whole hour lecture on this, but um, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily fascinating, and I have to say, I find it more fascinating working on this area than I had, than I did on astrophysics, as exciting as that was, this has so much more applicability to every one of us. One, question one, last, question. one last question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to try to get you fascinated in another area. Okay. Um, the unit of scale of human beings in terms of societal problems. Um, there's a lot of movement in terms of big data analytics, dealing with poverty, crime, those kinds of issues. I yes. come out of the south side of Chicago, so it's sure. an issue. I guess I'm asking where you see or see that going. I'll give you one little example or story. A um, woman I work with deals with, actually my wife works with, in Englewood deals with violence and how uh, community organizations are organizing to deal with violence in their communities. One night, this woman was on the block. She has an organization. She's working with young people. And this young man has his cell phone out, the one that you pulled out and whatnot, and suddenly she saw her face in his cell phone. And she's looking around because it came from some strange angle, and it turns out, and was alive, it was real time, the kid with his cell phone had hacked into the Chicago blue light camera system with his cell phone. And so kids, this is a teenager, who are already working through and using this technology that you say is now compacted into a cell phone right. in uh, ways that are at least engaging some of the social issues in, uh, that, that we see. But I'm just wondering where you see in terms of deal, this, this trend, this trajectory dealing with some of our social issues. Well, you ask a lot of very interesting questions. Um, at the mega level, for instance, we have at um, Cal IT2 a, a thing called the Big Pixel Initiative in which we're working with one of the highest resolution satellites that um, we're doing work on uh, the growth of the mega cities in the developing world. And you can actually, by looking at time lapse, you, I mean, you know about how many, what a huge immigration there is into the cities all over the world every day. How is that actually changing the, the development of cities? And of course, all of the services that have to get there, which aren't 
Uh, so, and, and so we're actually quantitatively being able to now study that and to bring social scientists and urban planners and so forth into it. So they're not just theorizing, but they're working on real individual cities, real neighborhoods, and hopefully uh, learning things that would uh, enable that development to happen in a, in a better way for the people living there. The other thing you talk about is the young people who are what we call digital natives. They grew up with this world. And, you know, this guy who hacks into this thing, I mean, if we, that's a great skill. And, and, and if we could harness this sort of innovation and ingenuity uh, that is now possible. I mean, you know, when I started NCSA, the idea that teenagers in South Chicago would all have smartphones that are as powerful as supercomputers, that didn't exist. You just had to say, well, you know, I mean, say you wanted to train them, you know, vocational training, right? Well, you'd have to get them to somewhere where there were computers, right? And now they're in their pockets. So we have an opportunity here that's unprecedented to reach people who have been left behind, to bring them along and to let them, in fact, show leadership, intellectual leadership and innovation. But we've got to get our social minds around how this world has changed and figure out how we can take advantage of things like that. And I'm very optimistic we will. But there will be some downsides because as you see worldwide, um, the hacking attacks that are going on are beginning to actually undermine our democracy directly. One last question. Actually, I have a comment. Uh, I feel like uh, my mother, she's 92, she saw the advent of planes, paper, well, well um, canvas and wood, to, to tin, to aluminum, to jets, to space travel. And now I see Hal and Colossus in my lifetime. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, also, uh, the medical possibilities. I mean, wow. Uh, I'm blown away. I've, I've, <laughs> I've, got, I've got questions on the tip of my tongue, but the Well, time... listen, I'm going to be there all day, uh, and I'll be at the reception, and I'll also be at uh, the evening event to talk to any of you uh, that I'd like to. But I just want to leave with one thought that you bring to my head. I know this all sounds like a lot of change. My grandfather grew up, got an eighth grade education in a log building, rode to school on his horse with his six gun and his rifle, and watched the covered wagons go into Oklahoma territory, saying Oklahoma are bust, and came back, some of them saying we busted. And he had me sit down on the couch with him on a black and white TV in 1969 and watch Neil Armstrong step foot on the moon. So I know we think in our lifetime we've seen a lot of change. But you know, a lot of generations have seen a lot of change. And they got through it just fine. It's our turn. And what are we going to do to take advantage of these literally unprecedented opportunities in human history. That's the challenge for us. Thanks. Thank you very much.